Hey guys, welcome. I'm very uh, happy to have uh, Dominic Frisby uh, with us today. Um, Dominic is based in the United Kingdom. Uh, actually, he's a man of some profile, both as an actor, a comedian, a voiceover uh, in a number of areas. He even has a music career. Nonetheless, uh, his hit song, Debt Bomb, um, that you can find on YouTube, amongst other things. He's also, very importantly, uh, smart in terms of the world of the macroeconomics, which sees him be positioned, strong opinions on gold, silver, uh, the role of crypto, and a variety of other core areas that we're all fascinated in. Uh, Dominic, please feel free to add to that introduction, and welcome to the show. Uh, thanks very much, Francis, for having me. Delighted to be here. Great, excellent. Dominic, I follow the Gatter guys. I want to get into start with silver and gold uh, and manipulation. Because what, what I'm mainly looking to do is apart from talk about things that many other people know and rehash many other reset type uh, content, I want to try spitball along with you with a good mind uh, about how it plays out. So forward looking and futurism. That means we're invariably going to be inaccurate and wrong on many things. But certain things, if we know where they're going where, with the end in mind, we might be able to understand a bit about how the dominoes uh, fall for precious metals investors. It's been a tough time for precious metals uh, investors. When I listen to Gatta and the likes of Chris Powell, it seems that uh, there's a tacit understanding that the central banks have a remit that they don't tend to speak about, that for this debt experiment based economy we have, Gold and silver, the management of the price in gold and silver is actually an unstated role for them as they perpetuate this game. How, uh, what's your take in terms of, is there a true price discovery in metals, yes or no? Um, I, I, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. And I'm a big believer in the, the, um, the, the maxim of sports psychologists where they say only worry about stuff which you can affect. And, you know, if the gold and silver price is manipulated, well, there's not a lot you can do about it. So you just have to uh, accept the world as it is and position yourself accordingly. If you're convinced that the gold and silver markets are manipulated, then you're probably best off going investing in markets that aren't manipulated. Um, they may be manipulated, they may not. I, I, I just don't know. I, I've been hearing stories in particular about silver for over 15 years, and there's been various um, inquiries, and none of them have, have proved f f fruitful. Um, the problem I have with silver, I, you know, I own silver, I own lots of it, I own silver miners. When I was first investing in silver, I was convinced that, for example, the, the gold silver ratio was going to go back to the sort of natural uh, figure of 15 or 20 by natural. I mean, because of the fact that the ratio of gold and silver uh, in the Earth's crust is is 15 or 20. So I thought it was going to go back to that natural figure. And yet um, there was one brief time when it went to about 30 when silver went to $50 in 2011. But apart from that little spike, it's been meandering between 50 and 100 since forever. Um, I used to be of the mind that silver's just got this extraordinary potential um, because of the fact that it's both a monetary metal and um, an industrial metal. And the fact that silver is in practically everything that we use uh, in so much technology. I used to think that silver was a sort of picks and shovels play, if you like, on on new technology because of the fact that every smartphone every computer so many um medical applications have silver in it but now i've just sort of i've grown tired of waiting francis and so i'm now of the <laughs> mind that uh, that um you know silver is just this metal with extraordinary potential and um extraordinary promise but i'm afraid it just never delivers on its promise there's no doubt in my mind that it'll go back to $50 at some point, but um, I just hope it's in my lifetime. i tell you why I ask, because um, I've been sort of doing this futurist mentality and approach on the metal. So we have China that has uh, that is holding American debt. Uh, people have, to my taste, too much of a national 
uh, approach and seeing, you know, force A against force B divided by national uh, boundaries, where I actually think there is this transnational force that we need to get discussed at a later point. But uh, if we just look at that, you're holding American debt, I think it's 1.3 trillion in China's case. And I uh, was spitballing, why doesn't China, who will certainly know that it, the Fed is the primary purchaser and monetizing this debt, why do, are we not seeing um, a, 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 a dumping, a, a, an uncontrolled dumping? Because if you're familiar with, uh, the, we've, we've had late nights on very thin markets in the Asian se uh, sessions, not for profit selling of silver which is, points to a, uh, a, a non-price discovery mechanism. But if, if the debt markets are being artificially held up by the Fed being the buyer of last resort, maybe it's a case of the Far East are becoming, um, China specifically, a major hoarder of precious metals, particularly gold, uh, but quite possibly uh, silver and other precious metals. Maybe there's a, uh, an, a tacit agreement of some form, and this is me overthinking this and analyzing and spitballing and totally speculating. But possibly the, the contract could be the non, um, the, the non dumping of US treasuries, providing the discount window, call it, for precious metals is retained open and it's a kind of a quid pro quo. In other words, the, uh, that nuclear weapon of not-for-profit dumping 1.3 trillion of debt is being counter swayed by maintaining a, uh, a discount window. And one of the reasons I say that is if you buy the Asian session um, only and you short the American session, essentially, on precious metals, you have one of the steepest curves that have ever existed. And if you do the corollary, um, you absolutely lose money hand over fist. So actually, the metals chart are made up of two totally divergent charts, one rolling over downwards, which is being open at the American session until the close, and the other one um, is being open at the Asian session until the Asian close. Um, and that's too bizarre to have such a polarity of pricing in two different geographic zones. So it points to a transfer. And that led me to speculating in the manner. I don't know if you've ever thought this through. Uh, maybe if you haven't, maybe you just have an initial comment. But could it be that there is a, a transfer of metals and that there is some kind of quid pro quo arrangement that is transnational? Um, I, I, it's possible, but I doubt it. I mean, there's a simpler explanation, which is simply that Asia is a net buyer. And the West is a net seller. Even, uh, but Asia is going to be a net buyer and they're going to want to be a net physical buyer. In other words, there's got to be some delivery on that. And at the moment, delivery is very low uh, on COMEX. Um, so most of the delivery is actually happening in Shanghai. So somehow... Metal still has to move geographically to the control point. Uh, and we're not seeing that. That's why I, I can't accept that uh, speculation, I suppose. But maybe, maybe it's something you haven't had a chance to think about. But uh, it's just something I was wondering. I've, I've done a lot of work on, on China's gold holdings. And um, I'm just plucking figures from memory. So forgive me if I get them wrong. But I think China's last declared gold holdings were about... Was it 1,500 tons? Yes. Uh, something like that. And a gross understatement, I think. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, dramatic understatement. If you look at, there's, there's several factors at play. Firstly, China's replaced South Africa as the world's largest gold producer. That happened somewhere in the um, mid to late um, noughties. And like, China does not export a single ounce of the gold it sells. Absolute hoarders, yeah. Yes. And, and most of China's gold production is state, state-run companies. Yeah. So it's realistic to assume that most of China's gold production is, making its, is, is falling into state hands. As Correct. well as being the, the world, like if you wanted to send the gold, gold price to the moon, you should just ban mining, gold, ban gold mining for three years. So there's no new gold supply coming to market and that would send the price higher. Miners actually, um, miners are net sellers. So miners actually act to drive the gold price down. Absolutely. China keeps all of its um, production 
and it is the world's largest importer. Yeah. And if you look at um, there's various people have done audits on it, all the gold going through Switzerland it, it, uh, f from London, making its way to. I mean, it's thought that China was on the bid, for example, when Gordon Brown sold his gold in the British gold in 1999. Um, but the, the gold that's going through Switzerland into China is hard to quantify, but what's going through Hong Kong is disclosed. And yeah. if you combine Chinese gold production and Chinese imports, and then you assume that 50% of all the gold that's made its way to China uh, has made it is, ha, a, 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 and that it's produced is now in the hands of the Chinese government, the state. And remember, you know, it's not just the Chinese central bank. The military has some the various departments will all have some gold. But if you um, put it all together, then you arrive at a total of over 15, possibly over 20,000 tonnes, which is more yeah. gold than America has. And it would make China more. the world's largest gold holder. Now, yeah. for China to declare that, um, would almost be tantamount to a declaration of war. Um, and you have to remember that it's something like 80% of Americans' foreign exchange holdings are in gold, whereas China's, it's like one or 2%, it's tiny. And even if China were to go up to seven or 8%, it would still be bigger that would challenge America's gold holdings. So yeah. I just think, you know, one day it will declare it, but for now, I just don't think China's ready. And so it's it's just declaring its gold holdings at the lowest end of what is believable. But in reality, its gold holdings are much higher. Now, there was some talk of this new Chinese central bank digital currency being actually backed by gold or in part backed by gold. That's right. And if it wanted that central bank digital currency, like I'm an English bloke, I live in London, I've got no use for the 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 yuan cbdc unless i go to china on holiday but if it was gold backed then i might have some use for it so if it wants its central bank digital currency to be an international um an internationally accepted currency all it has to do is got is back it by gold and it'll replace it when it when we move into digital currencies and ex escape the sort of the the current sort of physical fiat currency network then China will have a huge advantage over everyone else, uh, particularly as a stable coin. Um, so, you know, I'm sure China's thinking they're not stupid. They're, they're thinking of all these things, but I just don't think we're there yet. So bizarrely, you know, gold's got two things going for it and going against it. But what gold has going against it is we're in a world now where all the value is digital. Yeah. Um, all the growth is digital, you know, whether it's NFTs or shares in Facebook or DM or Bitcoin or trademarks or licenses or whatever. Wealth is now intangible. That's where all the big money's been made over the last 20 or 30 years. The physical economy chugs on, it grows at three, four percent a year. But the big money is has been in, you know, you just need to look at the growth. And isn't that a risk? It's going to keep being that way with the metaverse and Web 3.0 and all of that. It seems like we've got to forego a physical existence, um, uh, own nothing and be happy in our with our little Game Boy consoles in the metaverse where we are millionaires, casino owners. And this whole virtual existence is almost the new. It's, it's just getting stronger. It's not like it's going to it's a, it's a trend that's turning either. No, it, it, there's a scalability to digital that, that doesn't exist in the physical world. You know, if I invent the best mug in the world, I've still got to distribute a, a, a million of these mugs around the world. If I invent the best app in the world, I just upload it to the app store and a billion people yeah. can buy it. So there's just a yeah. scalability. But in any case, so in this world where all the wealth is digital and all the growth is digital, gold is the most analog asset there is. It is the single yeah. most analog asset. You know, it's the oldest thing in the world. All the, you know, gold is basically stardust. You know, it was yeah. created in supernova collisions billions of years ago, and it's part of the Earth's uh, substance and all the gold that's ever been mined is still exists. You can whack it to it's an atom thick, but you can't destroy it. And it's just the single most analog asset where in a world in which all the value is digital. So that's the problem that gold has. But bizarrely, 
and it's counterintuitive because it tends to be people who, you know, libertarians. It's also the feature, in a sense. Favor gold. Yeah. But bizarrely, if we go into a extreme inflationary scenario, as seems possible, although people have been saying this for 20 years and it's never happened. But let's say inflation really picks up and fiat money starts to dramatically lose its purchasing power. And there's a sort of we get a hyper Bitcoinization scenario. Um, you know, no government's own Bitcoin except possibly Iran and Venezuela and and El Salvador. El Salvador. Yeah. But the the so if we go into a hyper Bitcoinization scenario, the one tangible thing that all central banks do own is gold. And yeah. if they want to compete with with Bitcoin and so on, you know, they just revalue gold upwards and back their currencies with it. So that that bizarrely, the one thing that I think can save gold in this in this um, world where all the value is digital is is governments. <laughs> and the, the reason is because they own it. But it's ironic because so many gold bugs tend to be anti-government. Yeah, no, I buy that. In fact, one of our scenarios for how gold eventually wins and gets it is exactly that. I don't think it's ever going to be allowed in a normal paper market to trade up to some ridiculous number. I think as part and parcel of the reset, much in the way Roosevelt revalued gold uh, in the Great uh, Recession, post-recession, in 36, I think it was, or 32, I'm not entirely sure, from $20 to 35 um, it was more a case of it never traded up there. They just decided, right, we've got so much debt. Um, it's time we acknowledged its true worth. Uh, and so I don't think it's something you'll ever be able to have on a leverage platform as a long and make the money on. Uh, even if you've got the patience of a monk, um, it just it's not going to it's not going to come. Yes, there'll be spurts and bobs, but there will in that moment we have the reset and they call time and it's Bretton Woods Mark II three or four, um, there could just be, by a swipe of a pen, a major, major windfall that could occur. That's becoming more and more my thinking rather than the paper trading. By the way, I've also just got charts, just in case, I hope it's not distracting you, but just as you were referencing, the dollar's had a spell of strength recently. The euro's been feeling the pain. And I was just highlighting while you were speaking about China that the USDCNY has been one of the very few currencies that have actually uh, gain strength in the face of an increasing dollar index. And it, you could wonder about where there's, there's progress towards central bank digital token and a, a future declaration of its true holding of gold could actually make these ever grande and rather fear-based debts, property debts uh, scenarios shrink down somewhat uh, as, a, as a problem uh, and maybe uh, fluff up the potential attractiveness as you were referring. Because as you say, neither of us want a stable coin one in any way. But if it's now proven vaults where you can get real insight and literally see someone go around and there's racks and racks of gold in a vault uh, for miles to see and they uh, announced 25,000 tons or essentially more than Europe and America put together, you might be swayed to potentially uh, contract a bit more uh, on, a, on a digital yuan than anything else. Um, that was a fascinating uh, response, and you touched on a lot of really, really interesting uh, things. What's your take on how come debt, is, which is essentially yielding incredibly low numbers nominally and is a guaranteed negative yield in lieu of inflation? So Shadow Stats, who I'm a longstanding member of, uh, has got inflation in America at about 15%. Um, which means your current yielding 10-year, 30-year is a guaranteed loss at quite a high compounding rate as well. If you work, even if you give them positively, they're not at 2%, but 2%. Um, you're still going backwards on shadow stats as number at about 13. But let's say they've made their own stats where they say it was 6.7. Um, you're still going back at a 4.7, almost 5% compounded. Yet the debt markets are being retained. How, is, how much of this is a function of the Fed printing and monetizing and keeping that up because they're not ready to let the entire wigwam fall down on all our heads? Or uh, how much of that is institutions still having risk off moments and actually saying this represents relative value. I'll only lose a certain amount and assets are all going to be risk off and deflate. What's your take on how it's possible to maintain the Ponzi that is the debt market at its current yield and prices? Well, 
you know, I think the bond markets really are rigged. Um, and I can explain exactly how they're rigged. Firstly, just looking, um, the, the first way they're rigged is by the way that inflation is measured. Yeah. So if you go... They've got a new measure, by the way, planned, just as a quick input on that for January. Uh, they've got a new measure of inflation. I think they don't like the number that's coming out and they're referring, there was a zero hedge article. And you can imagine the effect that's likely to have as well. Sorry, carry on with your answer. Yeah, well, in the UK at the moment, we have inflation at 5%, official inflation. But if they use, and that's using um, CPI, but if they use their old measure, RPI, we'd yeah. be at 40 year highs for inflation, yeah. but they stopped using that measure. But just by way of an example, the housing market in the UK is up 12% this last year, 11 or 12%. Well, they don't include house prices in their inflation measures. No. And you know, everyone doesn't. needs a house. Mm. And so the pound in your pocket is losing 11, 12% purchasing power a year against houses. Yeah. And, you know, it's great if you own a house and it's rubbish if you don't own a house. Yeah. So, um, which feeds into rents so later one as well. Way by which the the debt markets are manipulated is because inflation is not properly measured. If you look at actual money supply creation, um, again, I, I, I'm just recalling these figures, so they're not going to be accurate. But it's something like only 13 percent of newly created money goes into the assets that make up um, the inflation index, and it's it's like over 80% of newly created money goes into financial assets. So every time you use leverage to buy a stock or something, that is a, a, effectively a creation of debt, goes into real estate and so on. So, but none of these, you know, you just need to look at the US stock market, the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ, which goes up relentlessly. It's a function of new, new money supply growth. Uh, but but the S&P doesn't count in, in official measures of inflation. So inflation, it only measures a tiny amount of where new money supply actually goes. And the things where it goes are prone to the deflationary forces of improved productivity and globalization. So the sure. fact that we're getting better and better at making stuff drives down costs and drives down prices, importing cheap Chinese labor costs, uh, uh, and bypassing, you know, Western labor markets, again, drives down prices and makes inflation look much lower than it is. So yeah. that's one way by which the debt markets and the bond markets are manipulated is, is improper measures of inflation. Which doesn't include, by the way, if I can add, shrinkflation where the retailers are, are cooperating and are packaging things up in slightly smaller sizes. Uh, intentionally uh, at the same price, which uh, is still parceled in the same parcel of goods as being a commiserate. Yeah. So the second way by which the bond markets are manipulated is is the rating system, you know, AAA, safe and all the rest of it. <laughs> and in the UK, it's actually the law that various pension funds who are the, you know, have probably more capital than any other sector in the UK almost, have to buy bonds. Yeah. What's the percentage that they must hold? Do you know? The, the law has to allocate a certain amount of capital to government bonds or gilts as we have them. And so that's the second way by which the gilt market is protected. And then the third way, of course, is central banks just buying their own debt, printing money and buying their own debt. So it is a rigged market. And, you know, the Bank of England yesterday put up interest rates to a quarter of 1% when real inflation is 20 times, uh, sorry, their measure of inflation is 20 times higher at over 20 times higher. And actual inflation is probably 40 or 50 times higher. So it's, it's a totally rigged market and it's fine for now, but it will, at some point it will implode. And, you know, people can still make money in the bond market if they, you know, buy a bond when it's yielding this and then sell the bond when it's when it's the basis point yields that much more or that much less. You know, there still can be money be made trading bonds. 
But the idea of buying, you know, a 10 year gilt that yields half a percent when we all know that full well in 10 years time, the pound is going to have considerably less purchasing power than it does now. It just makes no sense. So um, but anyway, that's what's it's you know, the law is forcing people to buy these bonds or pension funds and others to allocate to them. So that's how the bond market is rigged. And at a certain point, it will unravel. And when it does, it'll be very nasty. And you'll be mighty glad you own gold and silver. <laughs> that's why I put the two things together. That's a very good, in the way that you summarized, and that was a great summary, by the way, with the three key points, because I concur with all three of them. The way that you summarize that is perfect. Uh, it is a rigged, and that's why I say the, the, it, the, the, the similar rig that would be exposing that is gold and uh, silver, precious metals market. And that essentially this is a reset event because they're going to keep this uh, running, the Ponzi running, until they're ready to uh, introduce the new system. And as a result, the debt market fails or is jubileed out or whatever they, they, they do, they issue UBI or some token of central bank digital uh, for, for the pensioners that they've created out of nothing. And those debts get written in the, off at the same period that will then probably concur with that revaluation of gold. So it's almost we, we, we've discussed both sides of the seesaw, in my opinion, uh, in terms of debt being held up artificially high and the corollary being don't let the gold and silver markets expose that fact just yet. Anyway, um, let's take you to crypto, uh, Dominic. You were in quite early. Tell us about your engagement with uh, crypto, when you came in, um, uh, what brought you in, and what do you see future-wise? Uh, future uh, are you an out-and-out -out maxi on Bitcoin, or are you more open to um, the use cases that are coming out and the other tokens? Uh, where do you stand on uh, crypto more broadly? Lay your, your picnic stall out. Um, well, yeah, I, I, I was lucky to get in very early. People, um, I, you know, I was known as a person championing gold and silver and wanting a hard money system and written books and films about, uh, uh, I, I read a film called Four Horsemen where we uh, co-wrote that and we argued for, um, uh, you know, sound money. And because of that and various books I'd written, people got in touch when Bitcoin came along and they would just send me Bitcoin, bits of Bitcoin, you know. And I did. I, in fact, it was partly because I was writing Four Horsemen. I didn't get as in, I was so involved in that that I didn't go to as many Bitcoin conferences early on as I should have done. Um, so I sort of had some early on, but I didn't embrace it. I mean, I just wish I'd bought, you know, 50 or 100 grand's worth in 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 2011 <laughs> crikey but but um i probably would have sold too soon but the the yeah, yeah, I've still done, money yeah I, i've still done very well out of it um the it's taken me i mean i wrote a book about it and even after having written the book i still don't think i fully understand it it's such an astonishingly brilliant invention and the implications of it are just so enormous and i just think it's wonderful um and it you know the expression is bitcoin fixes this and it just fixes so much it's just tremendous and so i would urge everyone to own some and have some exposure to it um i think you can earn a great deal of money speculating in altcoins you can also lose a great deal of money you've got to be quite ruthless and make sure you're in for the bull cycles and out for the bear cycles. And you've got to be in charge of all your various wallets, MetaMask and Uniswap and whatever you're using. But as long as you're on top of all of that stuff and your fingers on the pulse and you know what the cool one is, you can do very well. And, it, it, you know, it's it's it, it, it's all about, you know, the secret is getting in as early as you can in some of these yeah. and picking the good ones. Um, but, you know, there's so many scams and so so many of this stuff is just idle experimentation. And, you know, I had um, an evening with a guy called Richard Hart the other day who's behind this thing called Hex. And just I don't think I've ever met anyone with so much money. It's just <laughs> so extraordinarily wealthy and very generous with it. And he's generous with his personality as well. But but I was like, Christ, I'd like to have as much money as you do. Um, but anyway, and you know, he made his money early on in Bitcoin and then in Hex. 
Um, yes, I know of it. So, you know, these currencies obviously are the future. And at the, you know, there are currencies where the technology is probably better than Bitcoin. The, you know, the mining costs are lower or the, the transaction fees are lower or the transaction times are faster or whatever it is. But the, the fact is that Bitcoin is still the dominant monetary network. Bitcoin has, you know, and the value of the fact that it has this huge first mover advantage and the words Bitcoin and crypto are almost interchangeable. And, you know, when email protocols came along, there were like seven or eight different protocols. And for some reason, SMTP was the one we used. And because we use SMTP, that is now the simple um, uh, mail text protocol or whatever it's called. Um, you know, because that's the one we use, that's the one that won. And all the other protocols have fallen by the wayside. So, you know, Bitcoin is the protocol. So while it remains the dominant monetary network, it's the one to own. Um, you know, I hear the is Bitcoin MySpace and there's Facebook still to come. And I, I hear both sides of that argument and I can sort of sympathize with both sides. But for now, Bitcoin as the network. Um, again, with Ethereum and all the apps and all the stuff, you can't not be bullish about Ethereum. It has its flaws, but Vitalik Buterin is a genius. You know, he's an extraordinarily clever man. And, you know, if you own Ethereum, you're effectively having some exposure to his genius. And yeah. uh, so again, you know, in Ethereum for now, it's the one that all the apps and all the stuff gets built on top of. So again, it has this, extraordinarily network powerful network and you can say well it's going to be cardano and it's going to be polka dot and it's going to be phantom or whatever it is and it might well be but but for now ethereum is the dominant network yeah and so you want to have exposure to it it may be that something else some other protocol comes along and supersedes it but for now you know if you just want simple exposure to the space and you haven't got time to follow all these altcoins and most of us don't then i guess the, the play is bitcoin and ethereum and they're yeah. in a bit of a bear cycle at the moment i think there are bitcoins at about forty-seven thousand as i speak it went to 65 ethereum's yeah, at about well three thousand eight hundred bucks it went to four and a half something like that yeah. you know you look at the charts and you go well ethereum could go back to a thousand and bitcoin could go back to thirty thousand or even twenty thousand it might do but it could also just as easily go to 100 or 200,000. So, you know, the the longer term, the mistakes have been not owning these things, not owning them. And you can be cute and try and buy the dips. And, you know, where's this dip going to take us to? I don't know. But for the moment, we're in a bit of a bear cycle. You know what I've done, uh, Riff, Riff, uh, I, I agree both are very important. Um, I am actually thinking that Bitcoin will lose ground long run um, on use case. I think use case uh, will dominate. Um, it, Bitcoin's becoming a little bit the digital gold. And in the same way, gold is a small, relatively small um, of our current economy use case will probably become larger. But that doesn't mean any one token will own that either. It'll be spread over a number of uh, possible. But I think use case generally will out, outgrow. The dominance chart of Bitcoin keeps generally being in a downward trend as we develop further. And there, it can't be master of all things. Um, but I still think that doesn't mean it's a bad investment. It's an excellent investment. They just might be quicker if you're in that space. But then you get the higher beta and the bigger swings. I've done something um, on that when we analyze Bitcoin. And I, I feel a bit frustrated that the dollar has become part of the story when you do that. Many people forget the other half. And I started looking at the risk on as Bitcoin's gone from being 2 million market cap, 10 million, 100 million. It was all driven by its own dynamics when it was that size. Now that it's a, 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 in advance of one full trillion and it's being put forward as a material alternative to holding uh, fiat and it's got institutional holders that are actually managing funds with other asset classes in it. I think it's become part of the risk on risk off story. So when we get fear and we get dollar strength, it's almost a pro fiat and debt environment, even though, as I say, debt is guaranteed loss. It's never a good time for debt for me, even if the world is about to end. Um, but what I've noticed is that 
tech is sensitive to interest rates, the growth stocks, um, and Bitcoin seems to have that similar um, vibe uh, to it. So we've started looking at Bitcoin divided by the NASDAQ, which is also a high beta growth investment on the exponential metaverse technology it's almost merging in fact facebook of course started with libra and now they've rebranded as meta twitter jack dorsey is very pro bitcoin these are these are social media and technology companies now talking crypto and that is just merging into one massive planet so i've started comparing it uh, on a the chart i'm showing is a as a bitcoin divided by the nasdaq as to where we are for our chartism, because that's what we do. Do you do, you do any cross asset an, uh, analysis, or are you just traditional? You look at Bitcoin dollar. Uh, I used to do a lot of that stuff, and I just don't have the time now. I mean, I, I think it's a valid exercise, and I agree that Bitcoin's a it almost trades lockstep with the S and P. It's like a risk on, risk off, and they both rise and fall together. Um, yeah. It's definitely a risk on asset. Um, yeah, I think it's a valid exercise doing all that cross uh, m uh, market analysis and ratios and so on. Um, but but uh, it's not something I do a great deal of at the moment. It's just, but that's only because I haven't got the time. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Um, and uh, you also like uh, Ethereum as a possible uh, holder because it's an investment not only in a uh, the i suppose all the layer 2 stuff that will be built on it but it's also an investment in real ip of quality thinkers uh, you mentioned vitalik and his capability it's almost there's a stock buying a startup stock with a great hive mind of uh, very metaverse web3 enabled people you're almost tapping into the resource and everything that might come out of it a bit like buying Amazon when it was making losses on the basis that at some point it would deliver uh, growth. Would that be a fair synopsis? Yeah, um, this is something, a general observation. Yeah. As someone who's been to a lot of gold conferences over the years, um, you know, the world's elite, the world's brightest minds, with a few exceptions, are not investing in gold they're not working in gold they're not mining gold there are some exceptions to that but you're not talking about elite thinkers you know people with extraordinarily high iqs you go over to the world of bitcoin and it is full of geniuses people with extraordinarily high iqs computer coders you know you talk to somebody like you know vitalik Charles Hoskinson, like I'm quite good friends with Charles Hoskinson, who's who started Cardano and he was at, at, at Ethereum. Yes. And he turned to me and he told me he was like 31. I thought yeah. he was 20 years older because he's just you so too. bright. Yeah. And I'm very I've been mature friends with him well. for seven or eight years. And I thought he's just got one of these faces. I thought he was about 40. And I've now discovered when we became friends, he was about 23 years old. He's just <laughs> so clever. And yeah. they the crypto world is just full of these geniuses, coders, and it's not just coding, it's 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 everything that, that they do. And the average IQ level of somebody in crypto is so much higher than the average IQ level of somebody in gold mining. Yeah. And you're like, you know, if you want exposure to all that intelligence, then, you know, buy crypto. Yeah. Yeah, no, I can see that. And it's also the future and it's where the exponential uh, growth is. Talking about elite minds, um, Dominic, I want to take you into a, uh, an observation that I've made. Uh, Pal was talking just the week past. Uh, so there's four. I want to I want to name check a couple of things. This is Jim Reichard's Road to Ruin book. Um, he mentioned ICE-9, the freezing up of the system and how an ICE-9 event is on the cards. He also consults to the CIA on war games. Um, Russia Today uh, last week posted uh, Israeli companies and Israel chief defense minister running a drill for a global hack on financial services. That's the second instance. Third instance, Jay Powell speaking this week. 
when he was talking about three interest rates hike, all conveniently pushed to the second half of next year, said we could foresee these things coming, but for any major shocks, for instance, and then went to go mention uh, a global hack on financial services. Then, of course, there's our friend Klaus uh, Schwab, who seems to have an incredible uh, record for making predictions. Um, and he he's spoken of far greater deflationary shock than the COVID pandemic that he also predicted uh, coming as potentially as this again, a global hack. It does seem to me, uh, as I've put my money quite big on, uh, an event attacking retail or, or generally not even retail institutional financial services as a whole um, could well be on the cards. They have a habit of practicing these things before they happen. What would uh, your take be on this and how, if it was a possibility or you deemed it to be one, how would you best prepare for those listening? Uh, you know, I, I would uh, not listen to too many people on the internet. I'd get out into the real world, use your eyes, um, don't ascribe to conspiracy, which can be explained by incompetence. Don't imbue perpetrators with too much ability. Um, so do you think it will happen or it seems maybe maybe you think that's a bit too much speculation? Do you think that's not likely to happen first before? You ask me what my advice to do is and I'm giving you my advice. Okay. Uh, and I found over the years investing and speculating, it's much better when you own the decisions. You don't buy stuff because somebody told you to. You've got to think about it yourself and, you know, go for a walk around the block, go for a walk in the park and make your own decisions and own them. And then because when you make the wrong decision, then you'll learn from it. But if you just buy something because somebody told you to buy it and then it doesn't work out, well, you don't learn anything from that. You just carry on list taking advice from randoms. So. Own your own decisions and. only concern yourself with what you can affect i said that at the beginning of the interview if you know klaus schwab's doing something well there's not a great deal you can do about it because klaus schwab's doing it and he's got you know all his davos mates or you know if china's doing something with this that and the other there's just not a great deal you can do so you know crypto is where all the growth is it's in a bear cycle at the moment but it's where all the growth is have some exposure to that have a little bit of gold and silver because you never know but don't get wedded to this idea that 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 you know we're going the way of venezuela and we're going to go and buy our groceries with gold sovereigns because i just don't think that's likely no and no we're not going to say, own your own decisions yeah okay so generally your advice is just make up your own mind as to what threats might be out there and take action according to what you think sounds pertinent so that even if you're wrong, uh, at least you develop from it yourself rather than being a copycat hero of somebody else's idea for which you had no understanding. Um, do you think there's a threat, though, uh, of that? I mean, is that just craziness um, talk or is there that threat? Does it is it real to you? I think the real uh we're definitely on this path to less freedom in the sense that, you know, I think Chinese social credit ratings are coming to the West. Central bank digital currencies, programmable money, you know, vaccine passports and all the rest of it. We're definitely on this path. And it's inevitable. All these things are inevitable. And I don't think there's necessarily one person orchestrating it. It's just, you know, where the tide is taking us. Yeah. But at the same time, as being, you know, before 1914, if I wanted to travel around the world, I didn't need a passport, let alone a vaccine passport. I could just go wherever I liked. So in that sense, I was more free. And I was only paying 10, 15 percent tax rather than 45, 50 or even higher if you factor in inflation. 
Yeah. So in that sense, I was much more free. But then, you know, I would have had to ride a horse to get from wherever. I couldn't have gone by car. I might yeah. have been able to go by train, but the train would have been much slower. Um, I couldn't have flown across the Atlantic or anything like that. Um, I couldn't have had a free phone call to my mum in, in, in another continent, a video call. I couldn't have had, you know, if I wanted to read the news, if I was in, you know, South Africa and I wanted to know what was going on in uh, England, the best scenario that I could help, ha hope for was news that was several days old. And, uh, you know, newspapers that had been shipped over, I suppose there was radio. Um, but if you go back 50 years, even before that, you know, news was spread by guys going from town to town, reading the newspapers or the town criers or whatever. So we were much, even though we were freer because the government played a smaller role in our lives, we were far less liberated. And in many ways, the world in which we live today, where I'm in a, able to, where are you in South Africa? No, uh, Cyprus, yep. Yeah. South African accent, though. Yeah. Okay, but I'm in London. I'm able to have a conversation with a South African guy who's living in Cyprus. Um, and people all around the world are going to listen to this conversation. It's just extraordinarily liberating. And, mm. you know, assuming I've got the right vaccine passport, I can travel everywhere, anywhere I want in the world. I can be in in China in, in about 12 hours. Uh, and then I can uh, go to someone, oh, I forgot to bring my coat. I can quickly dial up Amazon and get a coat delivered. You know, yep. it's extraordinarily <laughs> liberating world in which we live in. So even though it's easy to go, oh, the government less free, blah, blah, blah. but at the same time, you have to recognize the empowerment that modern technology provides, how empowering and liberating it is. Um, and that's a world that nobody else apart from people who are alive today has ever experienced. And we should be grateful for that and we should appreciate it and we should enjoy it rather than um, constantly worrying about about the things that we all worry about. You know, so I agree. There's a, there's a lot to like in what you said. Uh, basically, live in the moment. Um, don't go so black pilled that you fail to see the gifts and be grateful for what you have. As you've highlighted, you were you more liberated to do things than you were free compared to how free you were and how illiberated you were in previous decades. My primary concern in all of this is that there is an almost an end of cycle totalitarianism that they now have all the tools they have to seize absolute control in a manner that hasn't been offered or available due to technology and AI and that they they seize that moment. It's almost like we've been in a wrestle of opposing forces that have been reasonably evenly balanced for many, many millennia of dominance over subject. Uh, and suddenly now there's such powerful tools that even labor is no longer uh, required on the same level due to robotics and AI. This puts a head count on the population as far more do we need this amount of people. And there's that moment of opportunity where I've been wrestling you all this time and you're slightly more exhausted. I've got better tools and I can actually grab you by the throat for the very first time. And now you're absolutely Orwellian foot boot on throat uh, moment. And um, that's that point I feel with the digitization of everything lays down a platform for monetization, monitoring, surveillance, finance, surveillance, everything, surveillance, social media that is so vast um, that the power to affect your own decisions even is no longer 100 percent yours. And uh, that's where the totalitarianism that you refer to and I concur with might take a nasty crescendo blow off turn you know much like a market at the dot-com boom uh, a surge because people don't know the people with the power can't resist uh the absolute power because absolute power corrupts i think the real danger is not so much governments which is horrendously by, behind the curve like my friend thinks who's much cleverer than me and much richer than me He's convinced we're going into a world where we're all going to be in upmarket holiday camps with virtual reality headsets uh, on yeah. our heads, uh, 
being paid UBI. He thinks that's the world we're going into. And, you know, we are all of us addicted to social media. You know, social media didn't even exist 20 years ago. And now we spend 25% of our lives on it, 25%. And that includes when we're the time that we sleep. You know, we're all, and, and these, whether it's, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or whatever it is, it's designed to be addictive. And if you look at the, the market cap of the five biggest tech stocks, um, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and um, I don't know what the fifth one is. Uh, yeah. Their combined market cap is bigger than the GDP of every country in the world except um, uh, the US and China. Hmm. Facebook's network is three billion people. That's like, you know, three, two and a half times the size of China population wise on Facebook's network. Mm. Uh, and, you know, including WhatsApp and Instagram. You know, as soon as people can start sending money over WhatsApp and whatever, and that's coming probably next year. Uh, I mean, how extraordinarily powerful is it going to be? Yeah. And these large tech companies are more powerful than governments. And at the moment, there's this sort of unholy alliance between them because you know, they don't want their antitrust laws and anti-monopoly laws against them. And it, it suits them to, you know, help government out with all the stuff that government needs helping out with technologically. Um, and, you know, tech was definitely involved in the, uh, the de-election of <laughs> Donald Trump. Uh, yeah. So... That, but that, they're not, aren't they just the smart governments? You know, you get the bureaucrat governments, which I call sort of dumb governments who do the political jobs and eggs thrown at them. And this is the smart government. Aren't they just merging into this Maybe. ruling I mean, order? It's part of the blob, but the, you know, we're all addicted to it. And, you know, maybe we all need to just walk away from our computers and just go and live our lives. And um, I like but, that. You know, if we worry, if you're worried about, what's happening and that we are going into this world, then you can, you know, get your guns and your tins and your silver and go and live in the hills. And that might be a very happy life that you have up there, but you also might be missing out on a great deal of life at the same time. And um, so, you know, as I say, this is all where we're going, but you can only affect what you can affect. And so, you need to concentrate on having a happy home around you and and um, recognize and show gratitude for the incredibly empowering things that technology is doing for us, but also recognize that the, the, the huge danger that these large technology companies are doing. I mean, I dis when I look at my eldest daughter, she's just permanently on her phone and it makes me despair. But um, and and I'm sure it's doing her head in, you know, seeing all these other beautiful people and then looking at herself. And even though she is beautiful, she doesn't think she's as beautiful as the girl on Instagram. But the girl on Instagram is only showing, you know, her best face because she's posting that on Instagram. So there's this sort of enormous FOMO and dopamines and all the rest of it. And it's very, very dangerous. And I don't quite know what the answer is, but um, except to go for a walk. I like that, uh, Dominic. I think we'll close on that. I think there's a positive message in there. I think you mentioned the words gratitude uh, for what you have, uh, which your daughter should have, uh, and I'm sure uh, will have with you around to remind her. Decoupling from the grid, uh, quite important. Going for a walk, I ride bikes and things that just are sort of old school analog e exploits. And also not over worrying it. Um, there's certain things you can affect and certain things that are a lot bigger than you. Uh, and, you know, you can't throw yourself in front of the tank like uh, the Tiananmen Square guy. I don't think it's going to serve you long run. Um, uh, but uh, resist by I mean, the guy threw himself under the tank. You know, maybe he wanted to be famous. Yeah. But but, you know, it might have been worth it for the world. But was it worth it for him? Mm, absolutely. 
Yeah, no, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't choose that ending for all the tea in China, dare I say. Um, but thank you very much, uh, Dominic, for coming on and sharing us your great thoughts. Uh, Having all the tea if you're not allowed to drink it. <laughs> exactly. So tell us, uh, for people that are a fan of yours or would like to find out more, um, especially we've got a lot of UK folks that could possibly, if that's even allowed after Plan B, uh, to physically attend your events. But how should people engage with you? What's your uh, preferred uh, modus operandi and how do they contact you? Yeah, I mean, I've written various books, which you can read if you like. And, and uh, I've got two YouTube channels, one where I talk about economic stuff and the other for all my comedy. And um, you can find me on Twitter at Dominic Frisbee. And if you go to dominicfrisbee.com, I've got a newsletter and just sign up for the newsletter. And I don't, I've don't i only sent about one letter out a month or something, but there's always whatever I'm up to. You can find out more information on the newsletter at dominicfrisbee.com. Excellent. Dominic Frisbee, thank you for your time. I uh, hope you have a peaceful Christmas with your daughter. Somewhat gadget free. You get a couple of walks with the dog before in between the snow and the rain. Thanks for giving us your time. We look forward to seeing how you progress. We'll be watching your channels. Uh, all the best from the Market Sniper and us. Bye for now. Cheers, Francis. Bye-bye.